step into a world where two towering figures of African descent clash in a battle of ideologies and legacies. W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey united in their dream of global African unity, yet divided by their radically different paths to achieve it. Join us as we delve into their fiery rivalry, where intellect meets grassroots empowerment, and explore the intricate web of their contrasting strategies. As we unravel their stories, ask yourself, which visionary resonates with you more? But beware, this journey will reveal that even the greatest champions of a cause can have blind spots. Stay tuned and let's dive into the passionate world of Dubois and Garvey to uncover the untold layers of Pan-Africanism. W.E.B. Dubois and Marcus Garvey both shared a powerful belief in the global unity of African descendants. However, they both had very different approaches and different plans for making it a reality. They also both had a fierce rivalry with each other. These two men are also a great case study to explore the impact of what happens when two great black leaders who both want the same things happen to have differences that cause them to clash with each other. It makes you reflect on how much more can be accomplished when we work together. Let's explore their contrasting strategies and ideas. We'll keep their great contributions to Pan-Africanism at the heart of our discussion. First, let's look at W.E.B. Du Bois. When you think of him, think of the refined, intellectual, more educated black men of the 1900s. Born in 1868, Du Bois was a historian, sociologist, and a profound thinker who laid the foundation for what we now call Pan-Africanism. He was deeply connected to African culture describing it as a captivating force. In his book, The Conservation of Races, he emphasized that African Americans had a distinctive essence to offer to the materialistic American society. But he also encouraged them to broaden their horizons. Dubois urged African Americans to explore beyond their local communities. He encouraged them to learn about global issues like Indian nationalism, adopt concepts like public ownership, and even pick up new languages such as French or Spanish to enhance cultural connections. He strongly believed that international travel and a deeper understanding of different cultures would increase their participation in Pan-African. He is quoted as saying, American Negroes will see how capitalistic exploitation led by America is exploiting and impoverishing Negroes of Africa and keeping them sickened and ignorant and thus indirectly encouraging the color line in America. They will realize how American Negroes are in the position to help Africa, not only by their growing political power, but by their educational opportunities in the United States. When once the blacks of the United States, the West Indies, and Africa work and think together, the future of the black man in the modern world is safe. Dubois was never one to avoid confronting colonialism head on. He boldly challenged countries and individuals who supported colonialism, likening it to the dangerous ambitions of Germany. In 1920, he expressed support for the Jamaican revolts, comparing Jamaica to Ethiopia. During the same year, he strongly criticized the U.S. Navy secretary for taking control of Haiti and argued that Haitian freedom should be a significant issue in the U.S. presidential elections. However, Dubois was not just a talker, he had practical plans to improve the lives of Pan-Africans worldwide. His vision aimed to establish a cooperative commonwealth that would include African Americans, West Indians, Africans, and people of African descent living in Europe. Dubois also had innovative ideas for restructuring black economies. He believed that with proper guidance, the most educated and skilled 10% of the black community, known as the Talented Tenth, could combat poverty in urban areas by funding major construction projects. His vision was to create businesses that weren't just about profit. He envisioned consumer cooperation stores where profits were shared based on purchases rather than stock ownership, where every member's voice would carry equal weight, regardless of their financial investment. Dubois was prepared to launch this plan in 1940, but the outbreak of World War II threw a wrench in the works. Another hiccup was his optimistic belief that Talented Tenth would prioritize community upliftment over personal gain, 
turned out to be less common than he hoped. Dubois stood out as a leader who was deeply devoted to advancing the black community and celebrating African culture, more so than many of his educated peers. His approach to Pan-Africanism had distinctive aspects. Unlike some who aimed for complete political or geographic unity among all black people or supported separatist movements, Dubois prioritized democratic principles. His version of Pan-Africanism had similarities with Zionism, focusing on uniting efforts around racial identity and heritage. Dubois was ahead of his time. It wasn't until the Asian African Conference in 1955 that his ideas about Pan-Africanism and unity among people of color gained full recognition. Despite his efforts, Dubois faced significant criticism. Some labeled him as an elitist. Critic Margaret Halsey suggested that Dubois might have idealized the oppressed, implying that just because a group is persecuted doesn't mean they are without flaws. Dubois' perspective on international politics also faced challenges. He viewed white nations as inherently imperialistic and colored nations as anti-imperialistic. However, this black and white thinking didn't account for the reality that nations of color could also engage in imperialism for their own reasons. This is evident in his conflicting stance on certain actions by Japan in Manchuria and China. Additionally, despite his strong connection to Liberia due to shared history, Dubois overlooked some of the country's practices, such as pawning, which resembled slavery. He even celebrated Ethiopia's allocation of vast lands to Japanese interests, failing to recognize the imperialistic aspects of this arrangement. This complexity in Dubois' viewpoints highlights that even dedicated leaders can have blind spots. His biggest critic was Marcus Mosia Garvey. Garvey didn't hold back his criticism. He saw Dubois as a fallen warrior who contributed little of value to the black community. He even claimed that Dubois was merely a tool in the hands of white capitalists. Garvey didn't stop there. He went after Dubois' publication, The Crisis, describing it as backward and making fun of its association with the upscale Fifth Avenue. The tension between these two leaders reveals the deep divides in the struggle for black empowerment. If Dubois represented the educated and sophisticated black individual, Garvey presented himself as being more connected with the everyday, working-class people in the Americas. Garvey made things personal by targeting Dubois' mixed heritage. He suggested that Dubois was closer to being a white man than a black one, even questioning the sincerity of Dubois' dedication to black issues, labeling him as a professional Negro. In Garvey's words, this is why, in 1917, he had but the lightest of colored people in his office. When one could hardly tell whether it was a white show or a colored vaudeville, he was running at Fifth Avenue. Now let's delve into Marcus Garvey. While Dubois represented the refined black individual, Garvey positioned himself as more aligned with the darker skinned masses, the ordinary men and women in America. When Marcus Garvey arrived in the US from Jamaica, he brought a message that deeply resonated with African Americans. He arrived at a time when the NAACP's efforts weren't yet backed by federal laws. The Ku Klux Klan was resurging, and despite the high hopes from World War I, democracy still hadn't delivered for black Americans. On top of that, a surge in violence against blacks created a perfect storm that made Garvey's ideas especially appealing. Garvey's version of Pan-Africanism wasn't just about education and intellectual and cultural development. It was about taking back Africa from colonial powers, which he saw as reclaiming a lost paradise. His movement gave hope to many average middle-class men and women who felt let down by America's promises. Garvey's also took a different route compared to Du Bois' beliefs on the topic of race purity. Garvey saw the issue of race as black and white, literally. He viewed mixed-race individuals, particularly those conscious of their caste, as intellectual traitors and enemies who looked down on the poorer black masses. I believe that white men should be white, yellow men should be yellow, and black men should be black in the great panorama of races until each and every race by its own initiative lifts itself up to the common standard of humanity so as to compel the respect and appreciation of all. This set him apart from Dubois, 
but it also alienated many people who couldn't relate to his perspective on race. They believed he was trying to impose his Jamaican views on race onto the American context, where it didn't seem fitting. Garvey referred to his followers as fellow men of the Negro race, creating a sense of unity. His movement had specific roles for both men and women, with women having the opportunity to serve in the esteemed Black Cross nurses and men being invited to join the ranks of the Great African Army or the Universal Motor Corps. Garvey's ideas caught the close attention of European governments. His message resonated with black communities worldwide, and as Garveyism developed into structured programs aimed at Pan-African unity, raised concerns among colonial powers. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, also known as the UNIA founded by Garvey in Kingston, Jamaica, aimed to empower blacks through education and economics. The UNIA had a business-like structure, emphasizing both mutual aid and economic empowerment. Members paid monthly dues of 35 cents, with 50 cents going to the parent organization and 30 cents to the local division. This strategy helped provide a sense of security among members, which Garvey believed was a fundamental need. The Black Starline Corporation, although it ultimately failed, was perhaps the most ambitious endeavor. In its first year alone, it raised $610,860 through the sale of stocks and subscriptions. This investment allowed for the purchase of three steamships in 1921, after which Garvey embarked on a significant tour of the West Indies and Central America. Marcus Garvey had a talent for communicating in a way that resonated with individuals who felt marginalized by society. He understood the psychological impact of oppression and sought to counteract it by emphasizing the greatness of African history and the potential for a brighter future. Critics, however, saw his grand visions of African empires and the celebration of African identity as distractions from the more immediate issues facing black communities. They argued that while these stories uplifted people's spirits, they did not offer a path to improve their social, political, and economic conditions. Much like Marcus Garvey criticized W.E.B. Dubois, Dubois also criticized Marcus Garvey. He believed that Garvey brought the divisive issue of colorism between black and mulatto people from Jamaica to the U.S. He also thought that Garvey was not diplomatic enough with the British, who were crucial for international business. Dubois believed that Garvey caused problems with Liberia, a nation he considered vital for African-American progress. He saw Garvey as antagonistic towards the NAACP, an organization closely associated with Dubois. Finally, Dubois questioned Garvey's unrealistic claims about African Americans conquering Africa and doubted Garvey's ability to effectively manage businesses. Finally, he addressed Garvey's public criticism of his mixed race background and light skin by suggesting that Marcus Garvey was just internally hurt because he had been teased and bullied by white people not because he had any real issue against mixed-race people. At the end of the day, Dubois and Garvey both stood for similar ideals. The core of it was that they wanted to see the black peoples of the world, from the Americas to the mainland, and everything in between, benefit from the unity of Pan-Africanism. Dubois' take on Pan-Africanism was deeply rooted in his appreciation for African culture and life. He approached it with the sensibility of an artist, valuing personal, individualistic expression and feeling, which made him more of a thinker and an intellectual. His work is valuable, and his contributions cannot be overstated. On the other hand, Garvey's perspective was born out of living in a society where the dark majority were oppressed by a minority, making him highly conscious of the social and educational disparities faced by black people. He prioritized tangible improvements putting material progress before cultural or intellectual achievements. This is confirmation of the fact that much of what we think of as objectively right or wrong is simply the product of our experiences. Both are necessary in order to address the different facets of a very complex issue. Each contributed their best work to the shared body of global Pan-African enlightenment. Seen this way, the differences between Dubois and Garvey aren't about who had the better philosophy. They were two distinct individuals who saw the same issues, 
but through their unique perspectives. Pan-Africanism was actually made richer because of the diverse views and approaches contributed by both of these influential figures. Whose approach do you identify with more? Are you Team Garvey or Team Dubois? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you made it this far, give us a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and share the video. Thank you for the constant support. See you all in the next video.